This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So in today's video, I decided to go back to working with one of the coolest elements of all time, which is the world's only liquid metal. It goes by many names, such as Quicksilver or Hydrogerum, but most of us know it just as Mercury, and every time I look at it, I just can't stop adoring its insane beauty. Physically, it's a liquid with properties resembling that of many other metals, including electrical conductivity and beautiful shininess, resulting in a perfect mirror forming on its surface. It's also incredibly dense, taking up almost 14 times less volume than the same weight in water, and what's even more fun is that it's also super toxic, literally making you damper on exposure, which combined with it slowly evaporating at room temperature, makes working with it take some serious balls and safety equipment. Since I first heard about it, I have been really fascinated by its uniqueness and many useful properties, and I actually already made a video about it where I make it from a chemical called mercury chloride. In that video, I managed to produce about 60 grams of impure mercury through some great struggle and potential exposure to mercury chloride's extreme toxicity, which put a stop to my mercury-related projects for a while. That's because, toxicity aside, 60 grams is really not much to work with, considering mercury's extreme density, and before using it for anything, I would have to purify it. In the case of mercury, this can be done pretty much only by vacuum distillation that involves literally boiling it, which apart from the fact that I would have to boil a metal, is just crazy dangerous and at the time of the first video, I just wasn't feeling like it. However, now, almost a year later, my circumstances have changed a little, and apart from having an amazing new lab with tons of safety equipment, my total amount of mercury has increased exponentially. I won't get into much detail about it here, because I don't know if the YouTube overlords would like it, but in short, I now have a ton of dirty mercury, which opens up some interesting possibilities. Since it's dirty, meaning it has some unknown junk dissolved in it, I had to carry out the infamous distillation to clean it, and it went surprisingly well. For those interested, I made a video about it on my Patreon page. Anyway, I distilled the mercury into portions, the first of which I finished a few months ago and put away for long-term storage, and the latter I double distilled quite recently, making it more than suitable for chemical experiments. Now, I originally wanted to dissolve it and showcase some of mercury's incredible chemistry, but since it's been done before many times on YouTube, I wanted to come up with something fresh. After scouring the internet for like 3 hours, I came across something called mercury copper amalgam, and once I saw it, I knew I just had to make it. This mercury-based substance should behave pretty much like clay, and have many interesting properties which combined with pretty much no information on it anywhere, made me decide that it's exactly the thing I want to make. This so-called amalgam takes advantage of mercury's ability to dissolve many metals just like water can dissolve sugar, and normally this process is used to for example extract gold from sand, or make dental fillings. Amalgams generally have a lot of uses, in or outside the lab, and to make the copper one, I just have to combine my mercury with some copper metal. On paper, this sounds rather easy, but in reality, I can't just submerge some copper in my mercury and call it a day, because it would of course be too easy, and the universe doesn't like that. I first have to make some ultra-fine copper powder, which the mercury will be able to take up more easily, and before starting, I would really like to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an advanced all-in-one website creation platform made to allow entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Using it, you can create incredible websites with ease, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, and use them to promote your business or sell anything from regular products to your time. Squarespace provides you with powerful features like their new Blueprint AI, which seamlessly guides you through creating your own original website that paired with their state-of-the-art SEO tools makes your site show up more often and stand out from the competition, which is quite amazing if you ask me. In addition, Squarespace gives you access to their fluid engine which enhances your creativity to new levels with its innovative drag-and-drop technology, which along with Squarespace's new option for creating and selling your own online courses can grow your business exponentially. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com 
And when you're ready to launch, check out squarespace.com slash amateur chemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, to start making my metal play though, I first have to take care of the copper part since making it into a fine powder is way harder than it seems. The first thing that comes to mind is probably to take a piece of copper like this pure copper wire and sand it down to make some copper dust but this method has a few big flaws. First, the created particles would still be quite coarse, which is fine for pretty much every application, but turns out to be not nearly enough for Mercury's high standards. With physical grinding out of the question, there are still a few ways to get copper powder with a tiny grain size. The most obvious one is just to buy it, but such powders tend to be quite expensive and after all this is amateur chemistry and not amateur shopping. Other methods to make the powder fit much nicer into the scope of this channel and involve some interesting chemical reactions that take the copper in the form of a salt like copper sulfate and precipitate it out as a metal. This precipitation often results in the formation of some nice powders or sponges that would be ideal for this project and there are two main chemical methods for making the powder. The first one is electrolysis, which while quite simple, is always a pain to set up and keep running, and as I said many times before, I really don't like carrying out large-scale electrolysis reactions, so this method also isn't suitable. The second one is closer to ideal, and it involves using aluminum or other reactive metal to replace the copper in the solution and deposit it as this reddish sponge. This method is much more accessible than the electrolysis one, but I still had some doubts since the created copper would probably have some stray aluminum stuck to it, which would heavily complicate things later on. After excluding every popular method, I was quite sad that I potentially would have to resort to buying the powder and defeat the purpose of my channel, but right as I was about to accept defeat, I stumbled upon this quite interesting chemistry paper, which claimed that there is a different, more clean way to make a really fine copper powder. It was written by a Chinese guy named Song Ping Wu, and excuse me for probably butchering the correct way to spell his name, Anyway, in the paper, he claims that some ultra-fine copper powder can be made using the most basic of reagents. In theory, all that I'm going to need, apart from a source of copper, which in this case are these beautiful crystals of copper sulfate pentahydrate, is just some ammonia and ascorbic acid, otherwise known just as vitamin C. All these chemicals are easily available, and I was able to buy enough of them to make roughly half a kilo of the powder for very cheap. Anyway, to start the process, I first have to dissolve the powdered ingredients in water since this whole reaction will only happen in solution and first I wanted to take care of the copper sulfate. I weighed out 300 grams of it in a beaker and added in roughly half a liter of distilled water to dissolve it. This unfortunately won't happen at room temperature, so I heated this mixture up on my hot plate and in just a few minutes all the copper sulfate was in solution. It was so blue it looked nearly black and there was some insoluble green junk floating around which I had to get rid of to ensure a good purity of my future powder. I quickly passed everything through a coffee filter and was left with a good bit of an insanely concentrated copper sulfate solution. Next I needed to prepare the other solution of ascorbic acid and to start I weighed out 250 grams of it and it was quite weird to use so much of a food product for science. Anyway, similarly to the copper sulfate, I dissolved everything in roughly half a liter of distilled water with strong heating, this time the solution was nearly colorless and smelled weirdly of lemons. Before proceeding I have to add a second ingredient into it, which is roughly half a gram of regular gelatin, which according to Song Ping Wu should really help this reaction proceed. Anyway, I now have to make one final modification to this acidic jelly and that is adjusting its pH to 6, which should really increase the yield, again according to the almighty Song Ping Wu. The present pH of this solution is around 2 due to vitamin C being a surprisingly strong acid and to increase it to 6 I used quite a bit of a 25% ammonia solution, exactly like in the paper. This whole process made the solution take on a more yellow shade, making it look kind of like apple juice and now with my ascorbic acid fine-tuned, I could start making the copper powder. To do that, I transferred the whole vitamin C solution into a giant beaker equipped with magnetic steering and a thermometer through which I kept the temperature at a constant 70 degrees Celsius, which is supposed to be really important. 
Now to start I have to add in my copper sulfate solution, but I can't do it all at once for a very good reason that will become clear later, so to make its addition more gradual I set up this chunky separatory funnel above the reaction beaker. Before pouring in the copper sulfate solution I warmed it up with my old microwave I suddenly remembered I had to prevent it from crystallizing out and clogging my funnel's valve and when it was nearly boiling I added it to the funnel and was now ready to begin the reaction. I lightly opened the funnel's valve allowing small droplets of the copper sulfate solution to drip into the reaction beaker and pretty much immediately after they hit the vitamin C solution a pitch black precipitate appeared which quickly turned white and after a while completely disappeared. The overall color of the beaker's contents also gradually changed from yellow to this muddy brown which indicated the formation of the copper powder. In terms of what's happening here on a chemical level First, copper sulfate reacts with ammonia, forming copper hydroxide and ammonium sulfate, then the ascorbic acid, which under these conditions is a strong reducing agent, reduces the copper hydroxide to metallic copper, itself becoming the hydroascorbic acid, which is its oxidized form and you can think of it as vitamin C on retirement. This whole process relies on many factors such as the temperature which has to be kept at or above 70 degrees celsius and the pH which is best maintained at 6 by constantly monitoring it and adding in more ammonia. If not enough ammonia is added the ascorbic acid starts turning the copper sulfate into sulfuric acid which is quite surprising since sulfuric acid is much stronger and just kinda seems out of place here. If its concentration raises too much it starts doing some weird things to the vitamin C rendering it useless, so it's really important to pay close attention to the pH. Anyway the previously added gelatin is also quite important acting as a dispersion agent to make everything run smoothly, however it also makes this mixture really thick and causes a ton of this copper foam to appear which is the sole reason why the copper sulfate has to be added slowly. Anyway, foam aside, the reaction seemed to work quite nicely and I could actually see some copper depositing on the walls of the beaker, forming this reddish mirror which was really cool. After about an hour I finished adding in the whole copper sulfate solution and since the pH got dangerously acidic I proceeded to add in a ton of ammonia. This ammonia addition seemed to increase the foaming and combined with the solution now having a dark brown color made everything look like some kind of beer. Anyway to ensure a complete reaction I left this thing to stir at 70 degrees celsius for 2 more hours. When I came back it was time to filter out the created copper powder which was so fine it had no trouble staying suspended in the reaction mixture and formed these nice swirl patterns. I got it out of the solution using vacuum filtration which took forever because of the incredibly small grain size. I also washed the powder a couple times with distilled water to get rid of any soluble impurities. I then got it out of the filter and dried it in my lab oven which left me with these weird copper chunks. It turns out that the powder I made is so insanely fine it doesn't behave like a powder anymore and instead of being loose after drying it decided to become what I call copper clay. This material is really heavy and has a similar density to bulk copper, however it looks just like some dry clay and is also incredibly brittle. Apart from all the confusion and the product apparently breaking the universal rules of powders, this substance should be more than suitable to make the amalgam with and when it comes to the yield I managed to get nearly 71 grams or a whopping 92%. This means that despite not being perfect this process works really well, it works so well in fact that I repeated it 7 more times to process all my copper sulfate. This whole endeavor took me about a week and by the time I was finished I grew really tired of constantly dissolving all the ingredients and having to meticulously monitor the pH while dealing with that forsaken foam. Anyway, contrary to the first run, I didn't filter the copper out and dry it, but instead I allowed it to settle out and drain the created slurry into a separate beaker. When I was done I was left with quite a bit of this copper slurry and you can actually see that I did 7 runs because the powder from each has a slightly different color and creates a separate layer. Now before making the amalgam I wanted to clean this copper slime from the other reaction products and to start I got a ton of distilled water into it and stirred everything up. Now I theoretically could vacuum filter the powder out like before but I didn't want to wait like 20 hours so I just let this mixture settle out. 
since the copper is quite dense, it all settled to the bottom quite quickly, allowing me to suck most of the now dirty water out using a syringe. I then repeated the step a few times and was finally left with some pure copper powder. For obvious reasons, I can't measure exactly how much of the powder I managed to make, but since the yield is probably similar to the first batch, I managed to make a total of around 490 grams of some ultra-fine copper powder. It's really cool that my dear Song Ping Wu didn't betray me and his procedure worked really well so he deserves a shout out. Anyway, now with the powder ready, I can finally start making the amalgam. To do that, I will just have to combine my beautiful copper powder with some mercury, which on paper doesn't sound all too hard. The mercury that I'm going to be using is, as I said before, double distilled, meaning an incredibly high purity. For this experiment, I prepared this nearly 1 kilo sample and now it's time to open it up. It's sealed in a ziplock bag with this small paper pocket filled with sulfur to neutralize any vapors. The mercury itself is stored in this glass bottle with a teflon tape sealed lid. As you can see, when working with mercury, I have to take tons of safety precautions which apart from the secure storage, include working in a good fume hood and wearing protective goggles and glasses at all times. To make my workspace extra safe, I got my giant plastic tray into the fume hood to prevent any mercury droplets from falling onto my floor and slow cooking my brain. Ok, now with all the safety gear in place, let's take a closer look at the mercury bottle. As you can see, this mercury is really clean and doesn't wet the glass at all. It also makes this weird and oddly satisfying sounds when moved around and still surprises me by how dense it is. What's also really interesting about mercury is that it pours completely unlike everything else and how it forms a perfect mirror on its surface which can float almost anything. Anyway, to make the right consistency amalgam, in theory I am going to need about 20% of my copper powder's weight in mercury, which amounts to a little under 100 grams or 7 milliliters. I decided to first weigh out 80 grams and then add the remaining 20 if necessary. Now I can't just pour my mercury into the copper slurry and magically receive my amalgam, because copper has this tiny layer of oxide on its surface, making it quite resistant to mercury's attack. To strip copper from its only defense against mercury, I have to bathe it in some hydrochloric acid, which exposes the fresh metal surface for the mercury to eat into. To start, I first added a few milliliters of the acid into the copper slurry, along with the previously made dry copper powder. I also added in the pre-measured 80 grams of mercury and started mixing everything. At first, I thought that after a few minutes of stirring, the mercury would absorb all the copper, but to my surprise, after stirring this thing for like 20 minutes, nothing seemed to happen. I was really worried that Song Ping Wu actually did betray me or that this whole amalgam is just a conspiracy theory, but after deciding not to panic, I got this whole mixture onto a hot plate with magnetic stirring and after adding some more acid, left everything to react overnight. When I came back in the morning, this whole thing didn't look any better, which made me really sad. But after a closer inspection of the mixture's contents, I discovered this weird tear-shaped solid blob on its bottom. This had to be my precious amalgam, however it was quite weird that not all the copper had been absorbed and there was only a really small amount of it. I added 30 more grams of mercury to the slurry to try to loosen this tough mass up, and after stirring everything for a while, I decided that I might as well stop here and proceed to clean up my product. In theory, I could try adding in more mercury and leave this thing to react for like a week, but I have gone through enough struggle with this whole process already that I just said freak it. To start cleaning my product, I first drained off most of the free copper powder, which I could in theory use for something, but since it was contaminated with mercury, I got it all into my waste container to worry about in the future. I was now left with some incredibly dirty mercury amalgam, which I had to wash with copious amounts of distilled water to get rid of the residual copper powder. After a few washes, the beautiful shine of my product started becoming more and more apparent and its texture was exactly what I hoped it would be. I washed it a few more times since there was still a ton of undissolved copper powder inside it, I then waited and it turned out that the roughly 110 grams of mercury I added absorbed only about 40 grams of the copper powder. I was really intrigued by this since I thought that all this mercury would be able to easily absorb most of the copper and the amalgam's texture was surprisingly tough for how little copper it managed to absorb. 
This also means that I could have done just a single run of the copper powder procedure instead of 8, but I will just call that a learning curve and not break down and cry, which would be quite an appropriate response to pouring a week of your work into the waste container. Anyway, now that I somewhat successfully made the mythical mercury copper amalgam, it's time to do some science with it. When it comes to its texture, it's really quite weird and unlike anything else, it somewhat resembles play-doh or some wet sand, which is quite weird considering the copper powder used to make it was extremely fine. This substance is also incredibly dense, it's definitely not as dense as pure mercury, but still makes you wonder why humans get to experience such ginormous density. From a chemical perspective, it's a solution of copper in mercury, which is really weird to say since to a chemist who normally works with aqueous or organic solutions, copper isn't something that is able to dissolve. The texture of this metal solution also depends heavily on the ratio of copper to mercury and it's now quite saturated and you can think of it like metal honey, which normally is an extremely saturated solution of sugar. When it comes to its chemical properties, it isn't supposed to be too reactive since mercury is a very unreactive metal, however copper is quite reactive and since mercury removes its protective oxide coating, it can easily react with water and oxygen from the air covering the amalgam in this ugly crust. This actually gave me the idea to try out this amalgam as a reactive copper source by bathing it in some ammonia, which normally doesn't react with bulk copper, but forms bright blue complexes with its salts and I was curious to see how it would react to the amalgam. Almost immediately upon adding the amalgam to it, pretty much all of its ugly crust disappeared and the solution took on a light blue color which confirms my theory about increased copper reactivity and makes the contents of this beaker look like some futuristic ghost liquid metal technology. Anyway, I also wanted to test out how the amalgam behaves in contact with aluminum because usually mercury can leach into it forming this weird brittle structure. To initiate this process, some acid is often used to strip away the protective oxide coating of aluminum, but I wanted to see if the amalgam can soak into it just by itself. To do that, I got a small bit of it onto some aluminum foil, and indeed after a few minutes, this weird grey matter composed mainly of aluminum oxide started to form. The interaction of mercury with aluminum also makes it vulnerable to water, which creates a lot of flammable hydrogen gas upon contact with its surface, highlighting aluminum's high reactivity when its oxide coat is removed. Anyway, chemical properties aside, since I first heard about this substance, I wanted to see if it could be used as a material for sculpting. I mean, it would be incredibly cool to make some art with this metallic clay, which despite being poisonous and ultra expensive, has the potential to be really pretty. Unfortunately, after a lot of struggle, I wasn't able to form this thing into any meaningful shape since it has the wrong ratio of copper to mercury to be able to retain its shape, but nonetheless sculpting it is a cool concept that maybe someone with more patience in copper powder will pick up on. Anyway, the last thing I wanted to test was my amalgam's electrical conductivity, which turned out to be the same as mercury's and means that theoretically it could be used as a low temperature solder for specialized applications. Also, after playing with the amalgam for a while, I cleaned it out enough that I was feeling confident to try and hold it in my bare hand. While this contradicts almost everything I said about mercury safety, I didn't have any cuts on my hand and if I later wash it thoroughly there shouldn't be any problems. Upon contact with my hand, the amalgam feels just cold and heavy, and holding it is unlike anything I ever experienced. Anyway, now that I have done all the tests, it was time to seal this thing up for storage, and for that I used just a small plastic bag, which looks really weird with the amalgam in it, and will be stored in a bigger bag with sulfur in it to prevent any mercury vapors from escaping. This whole project had been a weird mix of partial successes and failures, but in the end, I think it turned out really well and it was really cool to make and test this really obscure substance. In the future, I plan to explore more of Mercury's interesting properties and maybe make some more of the copper amalgam, but for now, after all the struggles with making the copper and mixing the metals together, I think that I have done enough Mercury experiments for the foreseeable future. For now, I have to thank you all very much for watching this quite interesting project, if you enjoyed it you can like this video, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. 
If you want to further support my work and gain access to exclusive content unsuitable for YouTube, as well as having your name displayed at the end of every video, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, a gigantic thank you goes to all my wonderful Patreon members for their support which allows me to take on such dangerous projects. And see you guys in the next video.